Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. First of all, I'd like to uh, extend a big thank you to our sponsors today, Sherry and Adrian Goldfarb and Gail Halpert. In memory of Adrian's mother, Liba Goldfarb, may her memory be for a blessing and all the Torah that we learned today uh, elevate her soul. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for sponsoring. Uh, and if anybody else wants to sponsor things, any class, please be in touch with me. Different classes are different amounts. Um, and uh, of course, everything helps. So please uh, be in touch with me if you'd like to sponsor anything. So today we're talking about finding greatness in Shavuos, right? Uh, Shavuos, finding your greatness. And the question is, uh, no duh. <laughs> like, that's easy. Shavuos, we got uh, the holiday of, uh, of receiving the Torah. So of course we're going to find our greatness. Okay, that's it. Class is done. Of course, there's a lot more to it. How do we find our greatness in Shavuos? How is it that the holiday of Shavuos really could change us and that we could connect to the energy of that day? There's many different uh, approaches, uh, many different uh, ways of connecting to it. Today, I want to talk about one idea. And if we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll expand on another idea. But I want to home in on one very important concept. And that is the concept of the relationship in between our individuality uh, and, our, and, 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 and our connection with other people. Uh, and how do we keep that all um, you know, united together and uh, making sure that we are, uh, are, we, we are staying strong to our convictions at the same time having our individuality? How do we do such a thing? Sounds complicated, but listen to this unbelievable verse. I know we're going to expand on this, on this verse. The verse says like this, in this week's Torah portion, as we mentioned in the morning minute, right, there is no, there is no uh, coincidence that this week's parsha falls out before the holiday of Shavuos. And in the morning minute, we said a couple of beautiful ideas. I want to, I want to let you in another beautiful insight. A little further into this parasha, right? chapter 2, Parak Beis, beginning of Parak Beis, talks about how the Jewish people encamped in the desert. All right, how do they travel and how do they encamp? So it tells us like this, and God spoke to Moshe and Aaron saying, right, a man with his degel, with his flag, with his tribe, right, with his father's house, that's how the Jewish people should rest, right, when they rest, yachanu. And then it goes ahead, and then and it says what? But how do they encamp? So each person is encamping with his encamp with his tribe with his dagal. But saviv mode around the olam mode. What's the olam mode? The olam mode is the tabernacles, right? The tabernacles. So the Jewish people when they're encamping in the desert, they encamp around the tabernacles. But it says every person to his tribe and within his tribe to his household. And then the verse goes a little further and it tells you how there was a group of tribes that also were clustered together. So we had, it continues, it says, Kedma, Mizracha, right? Uh, going uh, to the, the encampment right? of, of, um, of the banner of Judah, right? Should encamp. Right? But with the banner of Judah, right, there were other, other tribes, right? Yusachar and Naphtali. Right? They were together with the tribe of Ju Judah. So basically, right, just to quickly paraphrase, I'm not going to go through the whole, ver the whole chapter, right? but the way it was with those four tribes together, th sorry, three tribes together, the four corners surrounding the tabernacle. So the tabernacles were in the middle. You had three tribes here. Three tribes here, three tribes here, and another three tribes here. And the tribes were in surrounding the tabernacles were in the middle. But the Torah goes out specifically and tells us that a person has to encamp with his tribe. And the person has to encamp not only with his tribe, but the group of his tribe. And each one had their own degel, their own flag. But at the same time, they're all encamping around the tabernacles. It couldn't just be. It just couldn't just be anywhere they wanted, and it couldn't be like uh, just a, a line going this way and a line going that way, and that's it. Couldn't be that I'm here and you're there, and let's just all mix together and be one big happy family. No, there's an order, 
The commentators want to know why. What was the purpose of this order? What was the purpose of them being surrounded around the tabernacles? What, what's the significance of it? And what are we supposed to learn from this? So before we answer this question, we have to understand why does the Torah have to go ahead and, and make a big deal about the individual encamping with his degel, with his flag. Degel literally means a, a flag. With his flag and, and with his family, with his, with his tribe, and then with the group of tribes. Well, why does it just say, hey, God told the Jewish people they should encamp around the tabernacle. What's the purpose of emphasizing that it's with the flag? Emphasizing that it's with the household, with your tribe. What's the purpose of, of emphasizing of all that stuff? What, what's the purpose? What's the Torah trying to teach us? So there's this beautiful idea and a very powerful concept for us to, to, re, to reflect on and to think about. We have to understand that we're individuals. That's it. We are individuals. We all have different viewpoints. We have different ways of seeing things, right? We have, we have, we have, we have different flags. What does a flag represent? Right? I grew up in, grew up in, uh, in Toronto, in Canada. We have uh, our Canadian flag. I live here now, there's an American flag. Lived in Israel, there's an Israeli flag. There's a Swedish flag, there's this flag. And then every state has a flag. Every province has their flag. A province is like a state, for those that don't know, right? Uh, a province, every province has a flag. And then every team has a flag. These flags represent what? Represents your individual, your identity of who you are. And therefore, there's many flags for different things, for your state, for your country, for your city, right? For your team, for your school that you went to. Flags represent your identity of who you are. And actually, the, the, Midra, the, the Talmud and the Madras tells us that the flags had a connection. There was a lion on Judah's flag, and other flags, uh, the, the, the other flags had something that represented that tribe. It had something to do with who they are. A dago, a flag. What else does a flag represent? A flag is not only identifying who you are, but a flag also allows other people to see who you are. It has a dual purpose. I could have something in my home identifying who I am, right? I could have a, a big picture of what I represent, right? And what I, what, rep, what, what I stand for. But no one else sees that. A flag is not only telling me who I am, but it's telling everybody else. And therefore, it was very common, right? When you went out to war, there was a man, right? There was a, one of the soldiers, his job was to hold the flag. And if, it, the, if that man fell in battle, someone else would pick up the flag. That the other, the other country, the other army should know who this army represents to the extent that there was a job holding that flag. Famous picture of the American soldiers putting up the flag during World War II somewhere in the Philippines, I don't remember exactly where, I apologize. There's an idea, they put the American flag on the moon. There's the concept of the flags, not only for our identity, but for everybody else to know who I identify with. Why is that important? Why does God want every other person to know what the other person identifies with? Why does every tribe have to have not only who they, their, their identity of their family and their tribe, but also have that flag that everybody else should also know. What's the purpose of that? Why do we have to do that? So the commentaries tell us that the flag is, is, is something very powerful and a tremendous lesson that the Torah is teaching us and the importance with our relationship with ourselves and the relationship with other people. And I think it's something that we, we really have to focus on, especially in our days when there's a lot of diversity going on and a lot of disagreements on many different things. There's always been, right? But now new things have arisen. The Torah is telling us that one, first of all, has to stand for his ideals, right? You have to have what you believe in. You have to have your ideals. You have to do your research. And you have to do it. You have to believe in something. 
And not only that, yes, it's important that other people know what you believe. It is important. But how do other people know what you believe? By you building yourself up that other people see what you believe, not because you are, you don't take a flag and poke someone else out. A flag is you're building your identity and other people know your identity by you lifting yourself up, by you let, saying what you believe in a healthy manner, in a way that no one else is getting hurt. No one else gets hurt by a flag. It, it might encourage an army to go and conquer the other, the other land. But the flag itself does not hurt other people. You put a flag in your, uh, on your front lawn, you put a, a flag hanging from your house, right? Uh, you put a flag uh, your dra- in your car. No one else is getting hurt. Everybody else sees it. You are proclaiming yourself, not just for yourself, but out there. And other people are hearing your opinion. Other people hear who you identify with in a healthy manner. It's mind boggling. This flag has a dual purpose. Not only does it strengthen for yourself, you feel proud of who you are. You feel proud of what you identify and you want to hold that flag up high. But not only only by you building yourself up and being proud of who you are, you are also letting other people know in a healthy way. Letting other people know what you believe in a way that doesn't hurt them. They don't have to look at it. They don't have to believe it. They don't have to identify with it, but they then know what you identify with. So, 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 so the, the idea is like this, and we're going to get back to the other question, and then we're going to make a full circle. And we'll bring it back to Shavuos. The idea is like this. God wants us to, have, to believe in something. Of course, uh, we have to try to believe with what the Torah tells us, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Not only does God want us to believe in something, we have to be passionate about things. We, we're not, we shouldn't be just sleeping. Shouldn't just be by, by you know, just sta- people standing on the side. We're supposed to be passionate about things. We're supposed to feel and, and, and want other people to know what we believe in. But how? Not by hurting other people. Not by stucking them in the face. But we do it by raising our flag, by being the best that we can be with what we believe in and trying to make it that we are radiant, radiating, and we're, we're giving forth what we believe like a flag. And standing there strong, it makes me proud. It also lets other people know what we believe. Okay, so that's a flag, a nice class about flags, right? So you can say, okay, we didn't sign up for a class about flags. So how does this how does this fit into this Torah portion, or how do we sign fit this back into the holiday shuvas? The answer is, my friends, because in the Torah, as we said, it tells you that every person, when the umach, when each al diglo the voice of Esau each person with his dego, with his flag, with his with his tribe, the dego also is a flag with his father's house yachanu. They have to rest. They have to pitch their flag and say, "This is our tribe." And each tribe had their own identity. Yes, they did. They had different ways of approaching things. The, the, the Madras tells us that before the Anshe Knesset Gadola, the great assembly, uh, developed and created the Amidah, the 18 blessings, 19 really, right? Blessings that we have, our, our, our prayer book that we have, our organized prayer. Each tribe had their own unique way of, of, of praying. They all had their, their identity, their way of connecting with God. They had their own little unique way. They were proud of it, and they raised it up. Yachanu, they rested, right? They implanted within themselves their way of their relationship with God. But how do we make sure that it stays a Degel? How do we make sure that it stays, that you are proud of what, you're, what you believe in, but doing it in a way that doesn't hurt other people? And how do we make sure that what we believe in is something that's right? We can believe in a lot of different things. But how do we make sure that we believe in right? Goes ahead and says a verse. Right? Saviv lo They rested around the Oomoe, the tabernacles. What does the tabernacles represent? The divine presence. 
It says the divine presence rested in the tabernacles. And what was in, in the tabernacles? What was in the Holy of Holies? The ark. And what was in the ark? The luchos, the tablets. The Ten Commandments, the tablets that God gave Moshe to bring down from heaven, the spiritual tablets that was in the ar the, ar in the in the ark. So say your commentaries that how do we make sure that when we're proud with our flag, how do we make sure that we're proud with what we believe in, and we're doing it in a way, in a healthy manner, that we are doing it in a way that no one else will get hurt. But how do we make sure that what we believe in is right? How do we make sure that we believe in that we're going in the right way and we can have nuances of difference of opinions, different ways of doing it, as long as we're still surrounding the Mishkan, as long as we're making sure that the tabernacles, the Torah, the relationship with God is our nucleus, is the essence of what we believe in. Yes, it says, Shivan Pan in the Torah, the seven, 70 different, 71 different ways, there's different ways of connecting and understanding the Torah. But you have to make sure that you're trying to understand the Torah. We all have different brains and we have different ways and we're emotionally different. We have different ways of seeing things, but we have to make sure that we're not, we're doing it in a way that we're connecting with the Torah. The Torah, the Mishkan, was the gravitational pull of all the tribes that were surrounding it, it was a nucleus that was surrounding, making sure all these individuals were still a cohesive group, a nation called the Jewish people, the Israel, the Jewish people. And that could only be because they were surrounding the Mishkan. They had this gravitational pull of saying, ah, we are all trying to connect to God. We are all trying to get a relationship with God. And we understand that we all have different approaches. We understand that there's different nuances. But with those different nuances, we can go ahead and say, well, you know what? That's not what God wants. God tells me that's what he wants. No, that, then you're outside. You're not connecting to the middle. So you have to make sure that with all the new, there's Hasidim and there's Svartim and there's many different sects throughout history, different customs, different nuances. But they're nuances, the core of what we all are striving for is a relationship with God, is a relationship with the nucleus, the Oumoe, the middle. That, my friends, keeps all the individuals, all the different flags united together and makes a nation. That is what the Torah is teaching us over here. It's mind-boggling. The Torah tells us how they encamped. It was also telling us a secret of how all the tribes and how all the individuals were able to hold their flag proud, be able to hold their, their individuality proud and let other people know. At the same time, we're all together. We're all surrounding the same thing. We're all trying to get to the same point. My friends, that's why one of the reasons, as we mentioned, this is before the holiday of Shavuos. Because the holiday of Shavuos represents the same concept. How do we achieve greatness? How do we achieve greatness? That was the title of the class. Right? Shavuos, achieving greatness. What is true greatness? Is greatness that everybody knows your name? Is greatness that you've developed uh, you know, some great cure of something? That's important. Nowadays, we're all looking for a cure, an antidote. It's greatness that you uh, have uh, you know, split the atom. Those are, those are talents. And those have you, have, you, have, you have created, you've used your talents that God gave you and you did something good or unfortunately bad. But what is true greatness? What is true greatness? True greatness is the ability to hold your own, but at the same time realize that other people are holding their own and we're all trying to get to the same point. That is true greatness. True greatness is not allowing your ego, not allowing what you believe to override and to control your emotions and to control, what, control all your relationship with other people because of what you believe. That's, that's, that's not greatness. 
That's a flaw. You know, there's um, a lot of arguments in the Talmud. Many, many arguments in the Talmud. We have Rav and Abaya, right? Rav Hun and Rav Chizda, the great rabbis, they argue, right? They argue. And as we give, spoke about in other classes, I don't want to get too sidetracked with this right now. Right? They're arguing the nuances. The nuances might have a, a tremendous ramifications. Right? But they all, of course, agree right, of the Torah right, and the core of the belief of the Torah. That's not the point of today's class. There's, there's, there's two great rabbis of the, of the Mishnah era very famously had tremendous amount, uh, unbelievable amount of arguments. And who were they? Hillel and Shammai. Right? Famously, we know Hillel and Shammai, they disagreed on many things. But say the commentaries, right, that Hillel and Shammai, right, the halakha, the law, usually goes with Hillel. Why does the law usually go with Hillel? So the Talmud tells us there's a voice that came from heaven, the Torah is not from heaven. One of the reasons that are given is that when Hillel's study hall, when they studied a topic and they wanted to go in and understand the truth behind the topic, you know what they did? They didn't say, okay, students, this is what we hold and give a whole reason and proofs and everything why this is what we hold. And then go and say, but, you know, Shammai's opinion is like this and that's not why we hold like Shammai's opinion. You know what they did? On the contrary. They first said Shammai's opinion. They said, students, this is what Shammai holds. And they gave a proof why Shammai holds like this and the reason behind it and all the logic behind it. And then after it sunk in and after they developed it and, they, and it became part of them, they said, aha, one second. But we disagree. Why? And they went ahead and said why they disagree. And then they said why, what their opinion is. Says the Talmud, because of this, Right? That's one of the reason, one of the reasons why we usually follow the, the law with Beis Hillel, the house of Hillel. As the commentaries, the medieval commentaries and others, that's the reason why we go with them? Okay, so they said their opinion first. Like, what's the big deal? What, what, what's, the, what's the significance of that? And the commentaries all explain a mind-boggling thing. Human nature is that the first thing that we hear, and I've spoken to a lot of people, and I know myself also, I think about this, I'm about myself also, is usually the first opinion that we hear, the, the thing that we're sort of used to stays with us. And we try as much as we can to prove that correct. Unless we hear really unbelievable proof against it, right? usually that sticks with you. That's part of human nature. So the house of Hillel said, we want Shammai's opinion to have as much of a legitimate and, and the students to be able to choose their opinion. And we don't want it to be tainted in any way. And we want to prove our opinion without a shadow of a doubt. And therefore, they went ahead and they gave Shammai's opinion first. Let it resonate with them. And let the students develop it and think about it. Oh, yeah, here. And now that's the first thing that they heard. And then Hill said, okay, now we're going to tell you why we disagree. And now we're going to tell you what we heard. And then when the students of Hillel follow that opinion, they're not following just because, you know, that's what they heard first. But they're doing because intellectually they've thought about it, right? And they've developed it and they, and they, and they heard that opinion first. And then they hold of their opinion. This is greatness. That's why, I say the commentaries, that's why we follow the opinion of Hillel most of the time. One of the reasons. Because Hillel, of course, Shammai also had greatness. Right? But Hillel reached the level of greatness right, where he was willing to first say the other opinion first. When we're looking for the truth, when we want to bring out our identity of who we are, we're not only willing to listen to other people's opinion, but we will first tell the other person's opinion first. And then we'll disprove it. Not any emotions in the opinion, not disagreeing with the other person because, because of emotions or, or, or not becoming friends. And on the contrary, the Talmud tells us the greatness of Shammai and Hillel, that their children married each other, that many disagreements. They didn't let their disagreement influence their relationship. They didn't let their disagreement taint 
their view of the other individual. They had a disagreement because they looked at their disagreement with change the mind for the sake of heaven. That is holding your banner up strong, proud of who, what you believe, and let other people know what you believe. But as a banner, as a flag of saying, I'm going to keep it within myself that other people could see it, but I'm not going to go ahead and poke their eyes out. I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and hurt them or, or not have a relationship with them or, or stop talking to them because of what they believe and what I believe. A banner, a flag is being proud of what you believe and it stays with you and other people could see it, but it's not going to them. And that's greatness. That is the greatness of the holiday of Shavuos. It says by Shavuos, it says the Jewish people were around the mountain. They went around the mountain, around the mountain. The Jewish people reached a level, as we mentioned in the morning minute, right? They reached a level of ki'ishachad b'leivachad. They reached a level of unity of one. Say the commentaries, what do you mean by ki'ishachad b'leivachad? You say ki'ishachad, like one person. They reach such a high level of unity, like they reach like one person. We spoke about that in the morning minute. That's the power of connecting to the Torah, having achtut unity. I want to expand on that, relate, relating to what we're talking about now. What is greatness? Why does it say, like one heart? But they had one heart. They had many hearts. Say the commentaries, what does the heart represent? Moach is our intellect. Moach is what we believe in, our thoughts. Our heart is our emotions. A heart is where our neshama, our soul is. Ki'isha chad chad. Yes, they still had different opinions. They still held up different things. They were all from different tribes. But b'leiv chad, their neshama, their soul was united as one around the mountain, around the Torah. And the Torah was the nucleus, was a gravitational pull of connecting them all. That even with their individuality, they became one became one unit, one soul, one neshama, one body. And that's what the Torah is teaching us over here. That is true greatness. True greatness is being able to have your opinion, to be able to be, live with your opinion and know that other people have their opinions. But stand strong and you want other people to know your opinion, but do it as a flag. Do it in a way that you are, you're living your opinion, but not hurting other people because of your opinion. And how do we make sure that we stay on the right course? Because let's be honest. I know myself, so many times we could think of many different things and we could allow our desires and our, and, and our needs and our wants to control our brain. We, we spoke about this in the past, but I'll just reiterate it. And when we speak about, when we talk about the tefillin, and when one puts on its phone, he first puts on the hand and then the head. And why does he put the hand on first and then the head? And then when he takes it off, he takes the head off and then the hand. So the hand always stays on while the phone is, the head is on. Why? We spoke about this many times, but the idea is that the head, as we said, represents the intellect. The heart represents our desires, our needs, and our wants. The end of the day, what truly controls our thought is our desire. You know, I know I don't. I shouldn't be eating that extra piece of cake, but I really want it. I know I shouldn't be X, Y, and Z, but you know, I should really get up in the morning. I'll, you know, I'm gonna get to work early. I'll get the chakra sometime. All right, uh, give me five more minutes of sleep. Intellectually, it doesn't make sense. But our needs and our wants and desires really control. Therefore, the tefillin of the hand always stays on to remind us that our desires should be governed by what the Torah wants us, and that will help our intellect do that too. So we have these struggles, and, and we have to make sure that our, our flag is the right flag. We have to make sure that we are, we are we're holding proud to what the Torah tells us. Therefore, that's why the nucleus, the gravitational pull, is the Torah, is the Mishkan in the middle. But we have to make sure that we have our individuality. And, and that's true greatness. That's true greatness. Where do we find this idea also? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, we're going to have in a couple of weeks' Torah portion, right? 
uh, when uh, when when Korach goes ahead and uh, and tries a rebellion against the Jewish people. Right? What does Moshe do? Right? Moshe tells he says like this. They said we won't go. Moshe Rabbeinu goes ahead and tries to create a conversation with them. Moshe, the leader of the Jewish people. The leader of the Jewish people, there's a rebellion, go ahead and crush it. Engage them in conversation. Right? Not, only does he, not, not only does he try to talk to Korach, but he goes ahead to Dasim Barima and he sends to them. Right? And they go ahead and they rebuke him. Oh, didn't you take us to land of milk and honey? Right? And they make fun of him. What does Moses say? Moses says, Lo kamar echa nasati. I didn't take one camel from them. My whole thing was this, to be a leader and to help them out. But say the commentaries, Moses Rabbeinu went out of his way to reach out to them, to try to engage them, to try to have a conversation, try to reason that's greatness we see a thread going on over here great leaders have reached out to other people great leaders and great people do not stand on their own ground and say you have to come to me do not stand on their ground and say it's my way or the highway they try to engage in conversation they try to make sure that people understand and have conversation and they don't look down on anybody. They don't look down at people. That's greatness. And that's what the Torah teaches us. That's one of the secrets of the Torah. The secrets of the Torah is that the Torah is, is my work, what I have to work on. Most of the mitzvahs of the Torah are for an individual. There are things that we have to do in a group. We can't say Kaddish, and we can't say we can't daven with a group. Uh, we can't read from the Torah without a group. But almost all the mitzvahs of the Torah are an individual, or an individual doing something for someone else, tzedakah or things like that. But you could blow the shofar yourself. You could shake a little of an extra yourself, eat matzah yourself. All right? You build a, a fence around your roof yourself. The mitzvahs of the Torah, if you look through them, not wearing shotness, what not, you're not supposed to do, they're an individual based, mostly individual based. There are a few things that are communal, but they're mostly individual based. Why? And the answer is because we can only become great when we work on ourselves. The Torah is teaching us and God is telling us we have to develop ourselves. We have to make our flag the greatest flag that we can do. So we have to work on ourselves. We shouldn't say, well, I'll only do it if someone else does it. I can only do things because of someone else. I look at what they're doing, what they're not doing. That's not God wants. Don't look at what the other person's doing and not doing. Look about what you're doing. Focus on yourself. Not in a selfish way. That's why it's tzedakah. Right? And that's where the certain things that we have to do with the group. But the majority is you have to look at yourself and you have to tell yourself, am I growing? Am I elevating myself? Am I doing something that's going to make me great? Am I doing something that's connecting me to the core, the old moed, that's making me grow and become closer to God? Because if I don't do that and I don't work on myself, and I just decide right, to look what other person's doing or to try to infuse my view, what I hold, be it religion or secular, on other people without working on myself, that's not greatness. It's being a tyrant. That's, that's being non-friendly. That's not greatness. You could develop the atom bomb, right? You could create a solar panel, right? That will uh, save the save the environment. You could create uh, the 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 vaccine for all the all the plagues and all the things in the world. That's not greatness. You're a genius. You have talent. That's not greatness. Greatness is working on oneself and making oneself a beacon that is a flag, that people want to connect with you. People are proud to be part of you. And you're building yourself up and you're giving over your opinion through a positive light. 
than connecting with other people. And the Torah is the key to how to do that. Because the Torah is a personal thing. Torah is personal. That's what the Torah is. And when we're getting ready to receive the Torah, right? It, the Madras tells us in the commentaries, the Kabbalists tell, Kabbalists tell us that every holiday of Shavuos is as if as we're receiving the Torah again all by ourselves. And that's the idea of learning all night. Unfortunately, this year we won't be able to do it together, right? But hopefully we're going to send out an email soon. Or we're going to have Wednesday night, we're going to have a pre Shavuos night learning with different rabbis speaking. Stay tuned for that. But that is Shavuos night, to work on oneself, to realize that the Torah that God gave us allows us to get greatness because the Torah is personal. You have to work on yourself. You can't make someone else work on themselves. You have to think about what you're saying, Lashon Hara. You have to be careful what you put in your mouth. You have to be careful what you're wearing. You have to be careful what you put out of your mouth, making sure before you eat, make a blessing. What you do on Shabbat, what you don't do on Shabbat. You build a fence on your roof or not. It's a personal thing. It's to build yourself up for greatness. It's to create your own flag. But as our Torah says, as this week's Torah portion says, that flag has to make sure that its gravitational pull is the Oomoed, is the Torah. Then your flag and my flag and everybody else's flag if they're all connecting to the nucleus of the Omo, the Torah, we're all working on ourselves and connecting to it through the Torah, then we have a nation, the nation. Then we have the Jewish people. Then we have unity. Then we have that we're all working together with our individuality. And that's greatness. That is true greatness. When we're working together with our individuality and surrounding and all trying to connect to the Omo, to the tabernacles, to the tablets. And that's the Torah. That's what God gave us, the gift that God gave us. So we're going to conclude with this just to quickly recap. And again, a big thank you to our, our sponsors, right? Uh, Sherry and Adrian Goldfarb and Gail Halford in memory of Adrian's mother. Right? May her memory be for a blessing. So quickly, just to recap. We asked, why does the Torah tell us about a degel, a flag? What's the importance of a flag? We asked, why is it, why is it talking about an individual, and then why is it important that they're surrounding the Mishkan, the whole Moed? And we answered that the Dagal flag has a dual purpose. And the, number one, it's something that you're proud of, your identity. But it also, not only is it your identity, but it also allows other people to know what your identity is. And it's important to know that we have our own identity. But how do we make sure that our identity, number one, doesn't get to our head? How do we make sure that our identity, that we give it over to other people, not in a way that we're... We're, we're, we're stabbing them in the eyes, right? That we're doing it in a healthy manner. How do we make sure that we are, we, we, we don't look down on other people? It's with a flag. And when you're building yourself up, not trying to hurt other people by, tell, by giving over your identity to them, what you believe in, your thought and your way of looking at things. It's building yourself up like a flag. A flag stays with you, but other people still see it. And why do we have to be around the Mishkan? is because around, being around the Mishkan allows all the different identities to be in sync with one idea of building our relationship with God. When we do that, then our identity allows us to grow and to be great. Because we could have our individuality, but our individuality are all trying to build our relationship with God. And what is, allows us to do that? The Torah. As we said, the Torah is individual. The Torah is an individual thing. My Torah, my relationship, it's, it's my, am I going to, am I going to, what am I going to eat? What am I not going to eat? The mitzvahs are personal. There's a couple that are collective, but 90% of the mitzvahs are personal because it's allowing me to build myself up. And when I could connect to this idea, like Hillel, that I'm, I, I build myself up and I wear my flag proud. I hold my flag proud that I want to have that relationship with God. And I want to, do it with the talents that God gave me, but at the same time, work with other people. And we're all going to be surrounding, sitting together and be one nation. We do that with the power of the Torah. And that's Mount Sinai, the, one, of the, the, one of the greatness of the holiday of Shavuos. It allows us to have our individuality, but at the same time, be united as a nation. 
because we all have the same goal. We're all working to the same thing, to be around the Mishka, a nucleus, a gravitational pull to allow us to have true greatness. True greatness is not developing techniques and, and, and technology and, 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 and antidotes. That's talent. True greatness is working on oneself and to make a person that he's holding his flag proud, that he knows what he believes in and he wants other people to know that he believes in, but he's doing it in a way that doesn't hurt other people and he's doing it in a way that he believes in other people's individuality, but doing it in a way that he's surrounding the Mishkan with the same goal as everybody else and realizing that and working together. Wishing everyone a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, a big thank you to the Goldfarb family, Adrian and Sherry and uh, Gail Halpert in memory of Adrian's mother. May her memory be for a blessing. Uh, and uh, again, a reminder that we will uh, ha look out for an email for next Wednesday night. Uh, stay tuned to that, and I will stop the recording.